Right, we're going to be starting bacteria, prokaryotic cells, really. <clears throat> I'll try to keep it as short as I can. <clears throat> All, right. All living things are made up of cells. They're either single cell or multicellular. They have basic shapes that are uh, pretty consistent throughout the um, throughout life that we know of. Um, the insides are well, all have cytoplasm that's surrounded by a membrane and life as we know it has to have uh, DNA, uh, ribosomes, and some metabolic cap uh, capabilities. Metabolic capabilities means chemical reactions that they have in, inside them. <clears throat> Two basic cell types are eukaryotic and prokaryotic. We're going to focus on the prokaryotic cells in this lecture. We are going to mention eukaryotes, but we'll mainly uh, be talking about prokaryotes. So eukaryotes, these are ones with the true nucleus. Right, so that's right here. A double membrane bound nucleus with DNA <clears throat> inside of it. I also have uh, some membrane bound organelles. Uh, these are usually larger, much larger than prokaryotes. Prokaryotes, and then uh, eukaryotes are animals, plants, fungi, protists, uh, all of them from the kingdom of eukarya. Prokaryotic cells are uh, bacteria and uh, which mean eukarya domain, and those are the different kingdoms that are involved in those. Prokaryotes are bacteria and archaea. They come from the kingdom Monera, uh, but they are the domains of bacteria and archaea. They do not have a nucleus or any other membrane bound organelles. And they tend to be a lot smaller. There's a generic structure showing pretty much everything on a bacteria cell. Most of them do not have everything. They have some, if not uh, some of them, but not all of them usually. <clears throat> so let's start with the external structures, the appendages. Uh, two main types, either for motility <coughs> or attachment, are the major appendages. And then they have, an, again, an external structure called the glycocalyx, and this is the surface coating. <clears throat> so let's start with the flagella. Three main parts is, are the hook, uh, the, excuse me, the filament, the hook, and then the basal body. Uh, depending upon the type of bacteria it is, this is the structure will determine the, the type of basal body it has. Uh, flagella flagella uh, have different arrangements. So you can have a monotrichus, meaning it's a single one at one end, you see it right there. A lophotrichus, where you have a bunch of them at one end. Amphitrichus, where you have some at both ends. Or they could be peritrichus, where they're all around on it. So those are the arrangements of flagella that we normally think of as flagella. Uh, they have a chemotaxis or a phototaxis. In other words, they respond to chemical or respond to light. And it can be positive or negative. Positive, they're going to go towards the chemical or the light. Negative, they're going to go away from the chemical or the light. They don't have a conscious thinking of this. Uh, but what they do is uh, flagella move and they turn clockwise and counterclockwise, and this will determine whether they go in a run or a tumble. A tumble, they're just kind of spinning around, and a run, they obviously go in one direction. Um, if they have more of them in a set direction, more runs in a set direction, that is a positive, uh, going towards it anyway, I should say, that would be a positive chemotaxis and, uh, or uh, positive phototaxis. And what it is, is because of the chemical, because of the responses, um, if they get turned around and go in the wrong direction, it'll do a shorter run, so they turn, so they tumble more until they get going in the correct direction. So they'll have a longer run in a positive or in a certain direction if there is some kind of a chemical reaction or a light reaction on it. Uh, there's another type of uh, flagella called a paraplasmic flagella. You see these on uh, spirillum, the spiral-shaped ones, uh, bacteria. And they, it wraps around it, and it, you see the yellow right here inside here. Um, <clears throat> and so they'll wiggle, inch around uh, 
is that he'll spin, they'll twist, um, they'll do all different kinds of motions, uh, but these are not actually sticking off like we normally think of as a flagella sticking off of a, the, uh, the body of it. Now, fimbriae are an external uh, appendage sticking off uh, but they're really, they're small and they're bristle-like. And these are more for attachment instead of movement, like flagella for movement, fimbriae are for attachment. They uh, have some that are color, uh, color enhanced, <clears throat> showing the fimbriae. And down here, uh, they show uh, some E. coli that are using the fimbriae to attach themselves to the microvilli of the intestine. Oh, excuse me. So that way they don't get uh, washed away during uh, bowel movements or anything. So again, these are for uh, attachment, not for movement. <clears throat> Another external append uh, appendage is called a pili. Only gram-negative cells have these. Um, and what it is, it's, uh, it's a protein that will uh, branch from one to another bacteria, and it does not have to be the same species. All right, it can be a different species. And when doing this, the host uh, bacteria, the one with the uh, pili, can send some DNA over to the, uh, the other bacteria. It's, it's just a one direction movement of DNA. At, uh, it's just a, small, it's a piece of DNA. And um, this is called uh, conjugation. And this is one way that bacteria share genomes without reproducing, without sexual reproduction. Uh, so in this case, uh, I'm gonna say that this darker one is gaining some genetic information, which is going to change it a little bit uh, because it gains some from the first uh, bacteria. <clears throat> Uh, the glycocalyx is a, a, a sugary layer, glyco for glycogen, that um, surrounds the cell. If it's not very uh, organized, we call it a slime layer. If it is very organized, you see it's more thick, uh, it's thicker, more, uh, more organized, and um, we call it a capsule. And these uh, help prevent from drying out or from being phagocytized by uh, white blood cells, even for that matter. Uh, and here they're showing you some more. So this one here this is a slime layer. It doesn't look real shiny. Uh, and this here is one with a capsule, nice and shiny, because it's really organized on it. <clears throat> uh, these glycocalyx, again, uh, inhibit, again, dehydration, nutrient loss, inhibit the uh, phagocytosis of white blood cells, which in turn makes them more pathogenic, or they'll cause, they're more likely to cause a disease. And they uh, work in forming biofilms. It helps bacteria stick together so they can form a layer. Uh, and, and then they can kind of function together in that layer instead of just as an individual, they'll work together. I mean, you can still separate them out to be individual bacteria, but they, they uh, work more as a community that aspect, in that aspect. Uh, here is a negative stain. You can see that the capsule does not absorb the stain. So from a different chapter we were talking about. <clears throat> These are biofilms of bacteria on the uh, plastic of a catheter. Uh, they get in there, they can, uh, they're hard to get rid of or make, it, they're harder to get rid of and they cause infections. Um, and biofilms are everywhere. Um, if you ever go to a public pool, right where the edge of the water is on the pool, you'll feel a little bit of slimy layer. That's a biofilm. Uh, the ring around your bathtub, the ring in your toilet, the plaque on your teeth is biofilm. They, it's everywhere. Uh, the cell envelope. This is the uh, cell wall and the plasma membrane of a bacterium. There's two. These are for uh, the whole keep the cell alive, uh, well, it's protected, keep the inside one environment and the outside another environment. Uh, there's two main types of cell walls. We have a what we call gram-positive cells and gram-negative cells. Gram-positive cells have a uh, thick cell wall, and a gram-negative cell has a thin cell wall, but they have an outer membrane. So they actually have two membranes around surrounding this cell, and we'll get into that a little bit more. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, the cell wall, it pre uh, protects them from lice. Um, so they, it, from swelling up too much and bursting is what we're talking about here. It's made of pepti peptidoglycan, which is a combination of peptides, of proteins, and uh, glycogen sugars that make these, uh, these cell walls and interlocking uh, uh, mesh on it. Basically, it's a uramic acid and, um, oh, um, well, I'm drawing a blank now. Um, glucosamine, sorry, that was the other one, the glucosamine that uh, formed these, and it's an interweaving mesh going around it. <clears throat> so on that gram positive, you see this dark brown portion here. This is the thick cell wall. The yellow portion right there, you see it, is the plasma membrane. Now there is a space between the cell wall and the plasma membrane, and that's called a paraplasmic space. Um, if you remember on the paraplasmic flagella, that's where they're from. Now on a gram negative cell wall, again, the brown is the cell wall, the yellow is the plasma membrane, but they've got this green co color coded one that's called the outer membrane. It's a little bit different of a membrane. Uh, <clears throat> I guess so they end up with two paraplasmic spaces, one on each side of the cell wall, because it's between the cell wall and the, and the membrane. Uh, the extra membrane really helps them uh, protect themselves. And it has what we call an endotoxin, all right? This, so this outer membrane carry uh, has components in it called lipopolysaccharides, LPS. And as the cell breaks down, these LPS uh, get released and it's an endotoxin that uh, can cause damage to a human. It causes us to be very sick from it. <clears throat> Uh, they have pores that let uh, pores, proteins that let things in and out through the outer membrane and through the inner membrane. <coughs> There's a, a artist renditioning of it. There's that thick cell wall of a uh, gram positive, and there's that thin cell wall of the gram negative. Now, gram positive um, cells will have uh, lipotychoic acid. Uh, and the difference between a tychoic acid and a lipotychoic acid, lipotychoic acid goes all the way through the wall and the tychoic doesn't. And that's the main difference. But over here on the gram negative, you see both of them have a normal plasma membrane, but on this outer membrane, so the outer layer is full of poly, lipopolysaccharides, and that's that endotoxin that gets released when, they, when gram negative cells uh, die and break down. <clears throat> uh, we have a stain that differentiates between these, and it's called a gram stain, and it's the gram positive and gram negative. The gram positive are going to retain the crystal violet, and when we look at them, they will look purple. Gram negative will lose the crystal violet, but they will retain the saffron and counter stain, so they look red. This is the only stain that is used in bacterial classification. So it's important for that. And it's really big in diagnosing infections and uh, because of guiding drug treatments. Some antibiotics will work on gram negative bacteria. Some will work on gram positive bacteria. Some will work on both, but you don't want to use one that works on both if you know what type of bacteria. You, you can pinpoint it better if you know what type of bacteria, gram positive or gram negative. And that, that works better. And it reduces um, antibiotic resistance in uh, bacteria because you're not throwing one at all different kinds of bacteria. Uh, the gram stain process, you'll stain with crystal violet. You see that both of them do. Uh, then you'll add a, uh, iodine, which is a mordant. What does it makes it it's more of the stain stick to it. <clears throat> So they're both, again, still purple. You'll use an alcohol decolorizer in this. Um, because the thin so well in the gram negative over here, it, because it is so thin, the alcohol gets uh, decolorized, pulled out, which means the stain gets pulled out, but not on the thick wall of the gram positive. So then when you use your counter stain, since there's no stain present there, the red counter stain can stick to the cell wall. And when you look at them, the gram negative is red and the gram positive is purple because of that. 
If you only remember one staining procedure, this is the one staining procedure you should know. <clears throat> we have some uh, non-typical bacteria, uh, the Mycobacterium nocardia. They have mycolic acid in them. Uh, they appear, they're all gram positive. Uh, we use an acid fasting for those. Uh, yeah, and then there is also the mycoplasms and they don't really have a cell wall. They use uh, sterols, as in cholesterol, as a type of sterol uh, for their outer, it's not a wall, but to help their, their um, um, help uh, fortify their uh, plasma membrane. And these can be pleomorphic. Pleo, because they don't have a cell wall, which gives them a definite shape, uh, they can have varying shapes, so they're called pleomorphic. And that's what, that's what the term pleomorphic means it can have more than one shape. Uh, the cell membrane itself, it's pretty much the same as it is on any other organism. It's the fluid mosaic. You've got the phospholipid bilayer. You have proteins through them. Uh, their uh, membranes are all sites of react, chemical reactions. Uh, nutrients get processed through, process through them. They uh, absorb nutrients and discharge waste. Again, just like any other plasma membrane on any other uh, organism. <clears throat> Cytoplasm is basically the same also. Um, sugars, amino acids, salts, mainly water. Um, again, uh, cytoplasm is pretty much consistent through all organisms. Now inside the cell, now we've gotten past, we've got past the membrane, we're talking about the cytoplasm in the cytoplasm. <clears throat> in a eukaryote, you would have a nucleus. Well, uh, a prokaryote does not have a nucleus, so, but they do have a region where they have their, nu their, nuclear, their nuclear material, DNA. And uh, so it's a region, but it's not separated from the cytoplasm, so we call it a nucleoid. Anytime you see oid at the end of it, it means like, so this is nucleus-like. <clears throat> uh, their chromosomes are usually single and circular DNA, so it's double-stranded. <clears throat> um, unlike uh, prokaryotes, which are, excuse me, eukaryotes, which are linear, and uh, they can have multiple. <clears throat> Another neat thing about bacteria is that they have plasmids, which are small, circular, Again, piece of, looks just like a chromosome, other than, other than the fact that it's smaller. These are not essential for the bacteria to have. They don't need to. They don't need these to survive. Um, so, because of that, we can take them from back, from organisms and transfer them. So these are great for genetic engineering. We'll take that plasmid from one organism and put it into another organism, so it picks up that particular trait that we want. <clears throat> Those are also usually what get transferred on the pili or plasmids. All right, ribosomes. Uh, these are made up of proteins and, R and uh, ribosomal RNA. You have a small unit and a subunit. These are for making uh, proteins. All organisms have to have ribosomes. If you don't have ribosomes, you can't make proteins. If you can't make proteins, you can't survive. Um, that's one thing that viruses do not have a ribosome, so they can't process some new chemical reaction because of this. Um, they're a little bit smaller. They're a 70S size in prokaryotes uh, compared to an 80S in eukaryotes. Uh, and eukaryotes tend to have more. And then you have some other internal instructions called uh, inclusions and granules. These are for storing water and nutrients or even air for that matter so that they don't sink. <clears throat> Uh, depend upon the species, so they'll have different ones uh, for different items. Uh, these dark ones right here, these are called the granules, and this particular bacteria that has iron in it so that they can line themselves up with the magnetic uh, poles of the earth. Uh, cytoskeletons, uh, they have uh, uh, proteins that are in there that are, again, associated with the cell wall to help give them shape, uh, help them move a little bit, depending upon the uh, type of bacteria it is, but it's mainly for shape. <clears throat> Another uh, thing that some bacteria have is called spores. 
uh, they're showing you here that it's gram positive uh, bacteria, okay? And there's three main species, me, genuses that does it, Clostridium, Bacillus, and Sporosarcina. Uh, ones that can produce a spore have two life cycles, a vegetative life cycle, which is what we would normally think of as the bacteria sitting there uh, going through the normal chemical reactions, growing, dividing, doing everything it's supposed to do. And then we have the endospore, um, spor sporulation. And um, this is where it's uh, not going through the normal process, but what it does is making a spore not to reproduce, but to survive. So, <clears throat> and that's what it is. They are very resistant and can have a long-term survival rate. Uh, so the sporulation, again, the hardiest of all life forms that we know of, they can withstand extreme heat, drying, freezing, radiation, lots of different chemicals. It is not a means of reproduction, though. Uh, when conditions get right for them again, they'll, re they'll go back to a germinative state or go back to their, excuse me, they'll germinate and go back to their vegetative state, which is what we would normally think of as uh, bacteria uh, going through their life cycle. <clears throat> This is the process. I'm going to really simplify it here for you. Um, but the, the DNA is, the chromosome is going to replicate. Then it's going to separate out. And on one side, it's going to start coating it, making several layers of um, surrounding it. Uh, eventually, the other, um, the membrane around the cell is going to dissolve away. The bacteria, that DNA is going to break down. And what you do is you have this spore that's very, very hardy, and it'll survive millions of years even. And then when the conditions get right again, uh, it'll just go back to its normal life cycle and just live happy as it, as it ever was until the conditions get bad again. Then it'll start going through that sporulation cycle to survive. It's just simply a survival method. Think of it as going to uh, being put in frozen animation from some kind of sci-fi movie until you get woke up again. Uh, again, these things, there's no water in them, or virtually no water in them, so that's why they, uh, they you don't, uh, you can't boil and make them burst that way. <clears throat> they are metabolically inactive, so they just sit there and do nothing. Uh, the longest one we've found, we found it in 250 million year old salt crystals, and they reanimated, brought it, they brought, uh, turned them back into a vegetative state. We can kill them. It just we have to go through a pro a process to get to it done because they are pretty hardy. All right, some bacterial shapes. Uh, you have caucus, which are round, bacillus, which are rods, spirulum, which are kind of coiled like. And then you can have the, some short bacillus that are uh, kind of fat, so they call them cacobacillus. Uh, slightly curved bacillus are called vibrio. They look a lot like commas to me. Uh, so it depends on the species you're looking at and what's going, to, going on between them to, to uh, determine it. Again, pleomorphism. This is where the uh, shape will vary. So you're seeing these here at varying shapes. Certain bacteria are that way. Uh, and here's another arrangement, a palisade arrangement, which is what we're getting to now. Uh, as arrangements. So an individual cell will be a caucus, a bacillus, or spirillum. A group of cells could be as uh, what we're talking about now. So with the cocci, because they're round, they have more varieties. They can be singles, they can be pairs, they can be tetrads, which are groups of four. Um, they can be in clusters, which we call staphylo. Uh, they can be in chains, which we call strep. Uh, they can be in uh, cubes that are we call sarcinum. Now, if it's a cube of four and we're looking at it through a microscope, we, a microscope is a 2D view, so it'll look like a tetrad. <clears throat> and a larger group like this one here, uh, if we're looking through it in a, uh, through a microscope, will look like a cluster because we, we're not seeing them in three dimensions. So the, the sarcino, uh, to really identify them, you really need to see them in 3D. Uh, bacilli can be in singles or in pairs. Uh, they can be in chains also, uh, or they can uh, they can get into uh, clusters of cells. 
or they can get into what we call uh, the palisades, which is where they kind of fold up on each other. So think of a, a train, an accordion like uh, from a, like a train wreck where the cars get all pushed up side by side. That would be a palisades. <clears throat> So how do we classify these things? First of all, we got to look at them and find their microscope, their morphology, their shape, all right, and their arrangement. That's the microscopic morphology. Then we have their macroscopic morphology. So that's what this, the colony looks like, the shape of the colony, the size of the colony. Is it, is it nice and shiny like a capsule? Or it's got a capsule or something. So that's your macroscopic morphology. Then you can get into your physiology, your serology, and then the genetic makeup of it. And so the physiology is chemical reactions that it does. Serology would be what kind of antigens it has sticking on the outside of it. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we do that with antibody checks. Or then we can get in and do the uh, genetic DNA, identify the DNA sequences in them, and that's the genetic and molecular analysis of them. Uh, uh, Berge's manual determinant uh, is the uh, main one. There's a nice big five volume series. I have an individual volume series. Um, and we can break them down into RK and uh, bacteria. And there's five subgroups in there. <clears throat> this tells you a little bit about some of their uh, main characteristics. Um, the domain, the, the RK are the primitive ones, what we call primitive because they live in harsh environments. Uh, bacteria themselves can be broken down into the gram negatives, uh, the gram positives with the high G uh, guanine and cytosine, bacteria with low guanine and cytosine. You have your own list of bacteria that you're supposed to know uh, for your quizzes that I gave you. And here's a phylogenetic tree. Somewhere in the past, everything was uh, related and they kind of branched out from there. We have our bacteria, they kind of went one direction. RK kind of went another direction. There's not as many of them. And notice the eukarya came off of them. Animals, that's where we are. We are more closely related to RK than we are to bacteria. Um, in biology, they don't necessarily, excuse me, medical biology, they don't necessarily want to know exactly what species it is. They're looking for the cell wall, that gram positive, gram negative, really, uh, the shape of it, because that'll affect some things, the arrangement, and the physiological traits. What chemical reactions can they do? What affects them? That's what medical use does, really. That, that's their priority. <clears throat> As we get into this, we have different species of bacteria, okay? And then we can have strains or varieties of bacteria. Um, so, and, and, and a way to describe that one is, let's say we had a strain of serratia marcescens growing in a petri dish. Um, as it, it, can, it can change where you have a white one or a red one. And so those are different strains. If we take the red one and we grow it, then they'll be red. If we take the white one and grow it, they'll be white. So they're, they're both serratia marcescens. Think of it as more of a, um, like breeds of a dog. All right, that's what a strain is like. Now a type, also known as a serotype down here, uh, type is really talking about the antigens that are sticking off of the bacteria, and what our uh, antibodies that our body produces would attach to. Um, those, can, those can vary, and so we can have different types of a species just like we can have different strains of a species. And strains and type do tend to get a little bit confusing, for, uh, especially for people who aren't going into it very far. Uh, just know that it, that just means there is, there's differences between, uh, between individuals of a species. We have genetic recombination of bacteria. Uh, this is how, in other words, how uh, bacteria share DNA. Uh, transformation is, <clears throat> <clears throat> well, we have transformation, transduction, and conjugation. And what of this is, what this is, is that um, the genes will move between individuals of different species without any reproduction. We call this horizontal gene transfer. This recombination gives them a wide, 
very large diversity. So transformation is where the, the DNA is from the environment. So one bacteria dies, breaks apart, its DNA is kind of floating out there. Another bacteria happens to come in contact with it and absorbs it into it. So it picked up some DNA from the environment. That's what transformation is. Transduction, if you remember back when we talked about viruses, uh, viruses can pick up some DNA from bacteria and take it from one and give it to another one. So that's what transduction is. And then just earlier in this chapter, we talked about conjugation where one bacteria can give some DNA to another bacteria. So uh, this is one thing that causes, makes bacteria hard to uh, pinpoint because they, there is a lot of gene swapping going on, but it gives them a um, great diversity also because you, they change pretty quickly. So they'll mutate because of these different DNA strands coming in contact with them. We have free, most bacteria are free living and non-pathogenic. Right? We have some photosynthetic ones. Um, and these are ones that are obviously going to be doing a photosynthesis. Uh, the majority of the ones we think about are cyanobacteria, what we know as blue-green algae. Then we have some green and purple sulfur ones and some gliding fruit. <clears throat> so cyanobacteria are all gram-negative. Uh, they have thylakoids. If you look down here, these lines coming across, those are thylakoids. What those are membranes um, where you find lots of chlorophyll, uh, and this is where a lot of photosynthesis occurs on them. Uh, they also have a lot of uh, gas inclusions, and that keeps them from sinking, so they float where they can get uh, in, in water, so they get plenty of sunlight for photosynthesis. Then we have green and purple sulfur bacteria ones. These are more anaerobic, where they don't use oxygen. Um, and so they tend to be under the surface or in uh, mud. Um, and they, ha they don't have chlorophyll. They have what we call bacterial chlorophyll, which tends to give off their, um, gives them different colors. And they can be green, purple, pink, orange, red. <clears throat> they can be lots of different colors. They do not give off oxygen. What they do is they give off hydrogen sulfide, which is a rotten egg smell. And then we have some gliding and fruiting bacteria. Gliding and fruiting bacteria, um, they have structures that kind of let them slide across the surface in, in a kind of a slime layer, we call it. And uh, a very interesting thing about these is when they're ready to reproduce, uh, they will form a multicellular uh, body called this fruiting body where the cells actually start to differentiate and perform different functions. And it's very similar to a fungi, even though these are into the, either uh, single cell organisms, they kind of act like a multicellular organism at this point. And then uh, these fruiting bodies can be large enough to be seen with the naked eye and they will produce a mixospore um, and, you know, then reproduce and spread out and start a new slime colony. And that is, is that it? There we go. I'm not quite done. Some unusual bacteria, medically speaking, anyway, are uh, these are obligate intracellular parasites. So these are bacteria that have to be inside of another cell to perform all their functions. Um, these are very small bacteria. Um, and these may, since they have to be inside their pathogens, uh, again, they cannot survive or multiply outside of their host. Uh, the main one right here is their Ketsia rickettsii. It's transmitted from ticks, uh, and it's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. You can see the rickettsia, these little dots inside of the cell, and this is uh, an infected uh, eukaryotic cell because there's the nucleus in it. So these are very tiny, tiny bacteria. Another one is chlamydia. Uh, it has to, again, it has to be inside. It is not transmitted by bacteria, by uh, tick or arthropods like a tick is, or, or to me, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is, where it's just bit and it's transmitted that way. Now, in this case, it can be spread if a, like a fly walks on it and then walks on you, it can be spread that way. But that's not the same. Um, 
so, and then the one I'm talking about really is the chlamydia trichomitis. It's a severe eye infection, and it's a, a very common sexually transmitted disease uh, at colleges. <clears throat> um, but in third world countries where uh, hygiene's not as good, uh, flies can get in there, and it can get but again during even during birth, it can get into the eyes, and that's why it can cause uh, blindness. It's easily treated with antibiotics, but in less industrialized countries, they don't have access to medical facilities like we do. Um, so it, it can uh, we can it can cause blindness. You know? Another one is uh, chlamydia pneumonia. It's a type of pneumonia it gets infection. Again, we have antibiotics that can treat these no problem. Um, just keep that in mind. Uh, some RK, we've been, maybe they have been talking about bacteria, some RK. Again, closely related to eukarya, more closely related to them. They have different structures that are more similar to the eukarya rather than the prokarya, and that's what this uh, table's going for. Uh, but RK, really what I want you to know is that they live in, live in extreme habitats, so, so they're known as extremophiles. So it can be someplace that's got a lot of heat, or like a, a geyser, or a lot of salt, uh, like a salt flat or a salt lake or something like that. Some places high and got a high pH, or even a low pH for that matter. Uh, <clears throat> can be under high pressure, uh, so deep uh, underground or under um, in deep in the water, or uh, low atmospheric conditions, uh, so like high up in the air, high up on top on mountains. These are methane producers. Again, they like high temperatures. That's what the hyper, some of them do. The hyperthermophiles are. If you have extreme halophiles, that's the salt. Uh, then you, these are a lot of sulfur reducers. Um, but you can find these quite a few places, actually. So that's it for chapter four. Um, have a good day.